after nine, so uh, Alex just said that she had to put uh, on the Facebook announcement for this talk that it started at ten. Uh -huh. uh, but I think most people have been coming know pretty well if we started so, is, is anybody not been here before? Okay. Then I, I will go through my short intro then. Uh, my name is Terry Rich. I'm a uh, birder and an ornithologist. And I retired from the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, wow, 2014. So this is the fifth year of uh, my doing this program here at the Learning Center. So we meet at uh, 9 on the first Wednesday of the month, and I do a talk on some particular topic. And then afterwards we go birding. Uh, and of course you don't have to go birding, or you can go for a little bit or for as long as you like. If it's good, we often are out there for a couple hours, and if it's slow, uh, huh? or freezing. If it's slow or freezing, <laughs> it's close to feet like it was a couple years ago. Uh, sometimes it's a little shorter than that. We have binoculars for people to borrow. Somewhere, one if you don't have your own. And uh, what else? We're, uh, as I said, we're videoing this today. I've been putting talks up on uh, my YouTube channel, Bird Talk with Terry Rich. And uh, up to this point, Tom Carroll's been recording the audio and then syncing it up with the PowerPoint. So this is just going to be a flat out <coughs> video, and we'll see how good or bad it is. And that means I have to stand still, which is very difficult. <laughs> uh, one thing I learned uh, last month in my Ghana presentation is that some people are sensitive to laser pointers, and it never occurred to me. Anybody, if you're bothered by laser pointers, speak up, and I won't use them. But uh, I guess for some people, it's sort of like a, here's a flash, and it's not pleasant at all. They can't even really watch it. So. All right. Well, we will proceed. I already see a few more people uh, drifting along in here. So I'm going to talk about, I, I love working with bird data and doing uh, statistical analyses. I've gotten, uh, I just enjoy it. And I'm not going to drag you through too much detailed stuff today, but I wanted to point out some of the sources of data that we use in bird conservation and just kind of for fun. You may well know about some of these like eBird, but uh, we'll kind of walk through that. Uh, first, a couple of items of news. Christmas bird counts are coming up. But, you know, I'm looking for it. Okay. Thanks, RL. Again, look at the building a lot of on the website or the calendar for the details on the particular counts this week. Um, plug my own talk coming up the second time. I'm going to give my talk on Ghana. It'll be December 11th um, out at the Brilliant Library. So if you want to uh, learn a little bit about West Africa, it's been a fun, fun talk to put together. And to point out this on December 12th, thanks to Alan here, we have this 90-minute uh, film on backyard habitat. And this is going to be uh, one of many resources we're using to put together a new uh, course, I guess you call it, a new talk, a new presentation on uh, all things about improving your backyard for, for birds, maybe <coughs> plants, uh, water, and other features that attracts uh, species in. So this is going to kind of kick it off. Uh, there's also a book behind this, and I haven't seen the film yet, but I think it is going to be pretty interesting. So be aware that. I assume those are on the Audubon calendar as well, Golden Eagle Audubon. Okay, bird data. So, one of the things I spent uh, a good deal of my professional career doing was uh, conservation assessments for birds. And these include uh, everything from the scale of the state of Idaho to the scale of the Western Hemisphere. And the, the things we use to determine how vulnerable a species is are threats to the habitats, the areas of breeding and non breeding distribution, the size of the population of the bird, and the population trend. The population trend, uh, of course, is a really, really big uh, factor. We want to discover those species that are now, especially been going down for a long time. And of course, you can look at the steepness of the declines, and that becomes a very uh, <coughs> key piece of information when we decide what birds are going to spend energy and money conserving. Fortunately, there's quite a bit of uh, data on population trends, so I want to walk through a little bit of that. 
as I said, the, we've done a lot of species assessments, that is, a vulnerability assessments for birds, and the latest, the latest one that came out in 2016 has this beautiful gross beak on the cover because it's one of the uh, most steeply declining songbirds in North America. We will look at some data on those guys. I know you can't read this. You're never supposed to say that in a talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things we do then with these vulnerability factors is rank these species, as I said. And so here's a population trend and threats and population sizes. And when you do this, right on the very top of the list, just for your information, is gunnels and sage grouse. Tiny range, tiny population, steep declines, high threats. And then you go, go down through some other on here, lesser prairie chicken, California condor. So we rank these birds, those are all you know, super vulnerable, and then you get, as you get less and less vulnerable, you end up with things that are actually increasing, like um, powder doves, and things that are doing well, like robins. So not only uh, was, was the, uh, is the data used for that partners in flight plan I just showed you, but there's also an assessment done in, also in the same year of all of North America's birds, waterfowl, and everything else. So those, uh, those data, then are used to also rank species like this uh, got sal down in Central America that actually occurs in, in Chiapas. So we are able to score all the species of North America down to Central America. So now we don't, not only have our condor and our um, guns and sage grouse, but we can also talk about pet cells and cactus virgins, pygmy owls, and things that occur mostly or exclusively in Mexico as well. So population trends of all these species become a really big factor. The grandfather database of uh, population trend monitoring is the Breeding Bird Survey. It was conceived by Chan Robbins, shown here. And Chan made it almost 100 years. He died just a little bit before his 100th birthday. He was still working at the Fish and Wildlife Service when he was, uh, I think he was, had been working for 65 years. Uh, I retired after 37. I thought that was a pretty good run, but <laughs> <laughs> there's always some, some standard, somebody who does more, better, bigger than you, and Chan was one of those people. But he, way back in the 60s, he was noticing declines in common songbirds, and he said, you know, there's got to be some way we can set up a big monitoring program so we can kind of see, is this just my imagination, or are these birds really declining? And so he created the Breeding Bird Survey. He was actually more famous at that time for uh, putting out what, what in those days was like the second bird guide to North America. You know, everybody had Peters, the Peterson guide. And then this came out, it's like, wow, you can do two bird guides? <laughs> and now what do we have? Hundreds of bird guides uh, at every sort of scale. But So he was very uh, well known for this, this field guide. But in reality, the, the great, great contribution from Chan was setting up the Green Bird Survey. It was started in 1966. So we've got data from 1966 to the present um, for a pretty good part of North America. These dots show the Breeding Bird Survey routes. You can see the U.S. is really well covered, as is southern Canada, a little bit up in Alaska. But because it depends on roads, as soon as you get away from roads, you start having uh, many fewer samples. So the whole border, northern boreal forest, and of course, northern regions and mountainous regions, any place where you don't have a lot of roads tend to not be sensitive quite as well. Uh, just FYI, here are the eight routes that I do. Uh, three on Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge, one just off the refuge, and then um, one across the border here, and, and three in southwestern Idaho. The, uh, I did a whole uh, presentation on Breeding Bird Survey for the south, south, uh, Southern Idaho Birder Association. Uh, last fall, and that's another talk I might give again. They they asked me to put that together, so I go into quite a bit of, even more, quite a bit more detail than I will today on the Breeding Bird Survey and how it works. But basically, what you do is you drive a uh, 24 and a half mile route. You stop every half hour, or half hour, every half a mile, and count birds for three minutes. And it's every bird you see or hear, very strictly timed, and then you go on to the next, drive another half mile, do it again, repeat, repeat. So you end up with 50. Um, point counts basically. You're only to do it yourself. You can't have two people counting because it's very important to have a standard methodology. Two people see more than one person, so you won't do two people. You can have a person record for you, but there's only one person that is to observe. 
You can't pitch or do playback or anything like that. You just are a silent detecting machine out in the woods. Uh, did I cover everything? Yeah, so 57 points. Yeah. So that's about that. That's the technique. When you go to the Breeding Bird Survey website, then you can look at the data that have accumulated over time. The ones I tend to look at most, there's different things you can find there are trend estimates by species. Because typically, again, we're looking at how our, you know, grouse doing, how our condor is doing, how our red-tailed fox is doing. We want to kind of look at one at a time. But there's some other things you can look at if you go to the Breeding Bird Survey website. So just for fun, I went and looked at uh, Pine Siskin. And when you go to Pine Siskin, then you'll get this graph right or this chart right here. And it'll show you different regions. So the regions are the states. And then at the very bottom, you'll have a region that says the west and the east. And then at the very bottom, you'll have the entire survey. So you can look at species at different sorts of scales to see what the trends look like. <clears throat> you, uh, I don't know if you can quite see that, but they, they still have just done the analysis through 2015. So that's the latest. So Pretty soon they'll, I'm not sure how often, it depends on how busy John Sauer is, he's the expert behind the scenes, will uh, do another batch analysis of everything and update this whole thing. So you can look at trends for two periods from 1966 to 2015, or just the last 10 years. We've discovered, it may not surprise you, that some species, some species have like a long steady trend, either up or down, some bounce around, but some have had changes just in the last 10 years that are different from what happened before that. A lot of people think there's climate change effects starting to show up for some of these species, or maybe they're fine and now they're going down or even up. So now it's important to kind of look at the more recent bits of that trend. So you get, you get the whole period and then you can look at the last 10 years. And then for any given uh, region, like right here is Idaho, it's got a blue or a red or a yellow dot. And the blue dot means it's a really big sample size, and we really think these numbers are very good. If it's yellow, it's a stoplight, uh, stoplight uh, symbology, right? So if it's yellow, it's like, oh, the day is pretty good, but we've got our lives on it. And then where you've got red, so here's Pine Siskin in Arizona. Not too many uh, samples, so we don't trust that those data that much. But Idaho's good. Idaho's blue. So coming across here, you can see the trend. This is a negative 2.76. That's negative 2.76% per year decline. That's a very steep decline. Mm -hmm. You know how that multiplies over time as you uh, take off 2.7%, 2.7, 2.7. That's really going down. Over the last 10 years on Idaho is uh, <coughs> almost zero. So it looks like in the last 10 years, probably it's been flat. So historic decline and now flat. So that's sort of what you can uh, see out of those numbers. And then if you just click on the right there on Idaho, you will get the graph of what's been happening. So here's 1966. And this middle is the actual trend of Pine Siskin. You see how, how anybody can see that it was going down, 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 down. And then right about here to here, even though it's bouncing around, it's, it's stopped going down. So, yes? So are these the numbers seen through that one survey? Or? The, this is actually an index nice. of the numbers. What does that mean? It means it's not the raw count. It's based. So the Breeding Bird Survey has all kinds of issues. For example, if I don't count my route every year, then there's some blanks in there. They have to adjust for so you can't just take the raw numbers. It's a lot like Christmas bird count. You have to standardize it for effort in a lot of different ways so that you're not comparing apples to oranges. So there's an index, and it's mathematically a little messy. It's there if you want to go look at the formula and see how they do it. It reflects the numbers, but it's not the raw count. Let me just put it that way. And then these lines on the outside are sort of the error limits. For example, you know. John Sauer won't bet his life on that number, but he might bet his life that it's between there and there. Quite sure it's in there, maybe not exactly that number. So it's all accounting for the sort of the fuzziness in the system. 
birds move around, people change, people lose their hearing, you know, all sorts of things <laughs> make the data uh, messy. Uh, but this is st statistically significantly down over the long run. So here's the evening growth peak. Uh, it's amazing how similar that decline is, but notice that the evening growth peak is not plateaued, it's still going down almost on exactly the same downward trend that the system is showing. That national? This is uh, Idaho. Sorry, yeah, I, this is Idaho data I'm going to be showing today. Yeah. Uh, there was a recent article in the New York Times about the declining population of insects. So I wonder yep. about this connection with the birds. Do you see more of a decline in those birds that are insect eaters primarily versus seed eaters? Yeah. Because as insects are going down, then their food. So the, so the point is the decline of insect populations, and there's re, there's enormous concern uh, really globally about that, and and some people think that. The just continuing use of pesticides and chemicals and new ones all the time are, are sort of permeating the ecosystem and starting to just kill off a lot of insects. And let me say you know, that yes, the concern over insectivores, especially in aerial insectivores, like nighthawks and chuckles, widows, swifts and swallows, very those are harder to monitor. But there's a lot of concern that a lot of the big insects are no longer in the system. And it relates to uh, invasive plants, so plants from other countries that are being planted locally, and those plants are not being used by the insects as our native plants are. So one of the solutions here presumably is to decrease the use of uh, foreign plants, basically, and start using more native plants that will support the insects that we're concerned about. Right, so another factor, not enough of Enables plants for certain insects. Yeah. Yeah, and another thing too is, is people aren't thinking about it as plastics. Uh, what was I had a blog that I take that came up the other day. They did a necropsy on a washed up sperm whale someplace, and they found 150 pounds of plastic in it. And they're doing the same thing with like, albatrosses and other birds like that. They're just the you know the youngsters that they find in dead. They're doing necropsies and again they're full of plastic. Yeah, so there's especially seabirds that are out foraging, <clears throat> they can have a lot of plastic. That's right. Uh, it's interesting also to me to note how, remember how the systems are bouncing around a lot, a lot of variation over time? And here's another northern forest seed eater, basically. Not an um, insect eater during the breeding season, but they eat a lot of seeds. But look how steep and steady that decline is. It's really not bouncing around like a system. And even these limits are not nearly as noisy. So this looks like a very strong signal, which is not good news for gross peaks. Again, it's a statistically significant long-term decline. Now for some good news, it looks like the, in, the inverse of the system. I hope you like house finches. Mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. um, I get tired of counting them sometimes, but uh, they're, they've got a great song and they're very pretty. So here's house finch, and you can see the same Similar year to year bounce, 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 but look at the look at this trend. <coughs> and that's a statistically significant increasing long-term trend. Just pick off a couple others, but you get the idea and you can go and look at any species you like, of course, for any region you're you're curious about. So here's a lazuli bunting or lazuli bunting. Another de decline, pretty steady, a little bit of bouncing around, a little bit of bouncing, a little uptick right here, but again, long term, down. Rather different habitat, you know, everything. So these birds are wintering in northern Mexico and southern US. You know, our gross are way in the north, our siskins are north and then around here. But it's kind of interesting when you see the decline, it's like on the same same slope and you you know makes you wonder if that's real is there something affecting all these birds that we still haven't determined yet hope you like ravens <laughs> um, so they're doing quite well again starting in 1966 to 2015 and there it is <laughs> this jump here uh, doing great very strong increasing trend and when you see these 
these sort of error bars around the edge. Pretty tight right on the line. That means these numbers are really good. We feel very, very strong, strongly about any statistics having to do with Rob about with the Ravens. I always like to show this one, see if you can guess what it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, as I've told you before, this is exactly what's happened in my neighborhood. I didn't have a, a, I had never seen a collar dog until about four years ago. And I saw one in my neighborhood. Uh, I never had one in my yard until last winter. I had two in my yard. And now in the little area I walk with my dog in the morning, I have it up to from say 10 to 30 routinely. So my neighborhood is an exact replica of this line right here. We're not, none for since 1992, nothing, and then whoosh, and you take off. So that's what color books are going to You don't need statistics for a curve like this. You just look at it and go, whoa. And who are they edging out? Well, you know, there's some anecdotes about morning dogs, but nothing very strong that I've heard or read. They seem to be going into a space that's not being used by anybody else as far as I've heard or anything I've seen before. And I, again, when I think about my own neighborhood, they, they, the outpost in their stronghold is a, about a two or three acre horse little mini ranchette right there on on uh, Castle Drive by Cynthia Mann in the Northwest Nazarene Church. There's a couple acres there where a guy keeps horses. I think he maybe boards horses, got some chickens. So it's like a little ranch. And that's where they started, and that's where they tend to be found when they branch out from there. They're always coming back to that little ranch. So where they are right now, there, I, there was nothing there that I could think of that they're like pushing out. There's still house sparrows, still house finches, there's still a few morning doves. It seems to me like they're coming into a maybe an empty niche kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, if they are doing something, I don't think it's been, it's not a very strong uh, invasion or displacement yet, anyway, as far as I know. Oh, so morning doves, look at how noisy this, that's just nuts. You know, it's just nuts bouncing around, and it's so noisy and so messy that there's no detectable trend of morning dove. So at least they're not going down strongly. Mm -hmm. We know that. We don't know what they're doing. So when did West Nile hit us? I'm just curious, like, um, I think it that showed up back in the, yeah, um, to put the chickadee data up. I was, we were talking about that, I think, last time, Mike. It was, what, 10, 15, no longer than that, probably 15 years ago. West, I think it shows right up if you look at the chickadee data for the West. If you look at chickadees, magpies, no, sorry. Hmm? Yeah, like corbids, yeah. Corbett's, Corbett's, some of the Corbett's got hit magpies for sure. If you, if you went to this VBS and looked at magpies in the West, I bet you could see exactly when it hit. Well, we didn't see it in the Ravens. <clears throat> well, did we? That's pretty steady. Yeah, it's pretty steady. I mean, here's a pretty strong dip right there. Here's a dip right there, but it came back quickly. Uh, yeah, and I think it was... It doesn't, it, I don't think it shows up very well in Raven. If, if they were affected. Look at magpies, look at chickadees. Should have done that. <coughs> so, anyway, uh, the inevitable question are our collar does pushing out the ring does. So far, like I said, it doesn't look like that. You can make a case of that in that. <coughs> a few other findings on the Bird Survey website are distribution maps. And of course, uh, you know, you've got people all over counting these different birds, and so you can sort of look at, you know, where are there a lot and where are there not too many. And so I just picked off uh, the last map they put up for the black and white pie. So you can see in these, these sort of bright red or dark red spots, so right here is a real stronghold for magpies. Um, of course, here's Idaho. So east of here, up through Montana. Very strong, and then of course down in through down into New Mexico. But really, a lot of magpies scattered around at various densities all the way over into Minnesota. So, if you're curious about densities and distributions of these species, you've got these maps you can look at. One I thought was uh, it's interesting to me is the split between castings and Columbia stereo, and you can see quite clearly off the Green Bird Survey website 
where this line is between Cassins and Columbia's mm -hmm. just coming up maybe into the south, very southern part of the And of course, it would be really nice if the, if the field guides would use this information for their um, little maps, because you know, so far we're still getting pretty much flat maps. You know, here they are in the summer, there's no indication of how dense they are in different mm -hmm. places. But this data is sitting there to be used. I'm frankly surprised that one of the field guide makers hasn't grabbed this yet and given us a, a basically 3D map of distribution rather than a, just a 2D. You can also look at trends spatially. So this is a spatial distribution of trends over the entire Breeding Bird Survey web um, time period. And all the red spots are where the uh, where magpies have been declining long term, and the blue areas where they've been increasing long term. When you get something like this, it's incredibly messy, and you wonder if there's anything you can really learn or figure out about magpies based on this sort of a picture. I, nothing occurs to me. You'd have to look at a more detailed analysis of vegetation or something, I think, to make, yeah. make sense of it. But again, that, those data are sitting there for uh, somebody to take advantage of. Show you our color glove. Oh my God. <coughs> Increasing steeply everywhere. We already knew that, but this gives you the, the idea of what that looks like in this particular display. Here's our evening gross peak with strong declines. Look at all the way from uh, Newfoundland, all through the boreal forest, all the way across to southern Alaska, all the way through the Sierras, down the southern Rockies. Basically declining everywhere. So, Again, it sort of makes you scratch your head over what could be driving this, and you, know, you go back to something like some really big factor, like global decline of insects, global climate change, you know, some big, big, big thing. The other uh, possibility, though, with the evening growth speak is what if they don't like getting warm and they're just all moving north? So if they're leaving all these southerly routes, potentially, possibly, and just going up here where nobody's counting. So that could be, that's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> Same assistance. Mm -hmm. All right, RL talked about the Christmas bird count. Uh, he mentioned the count period, the diameter, everything you see it here. Um, definitely a good thing for beginners and casual birders to get involved in, because then you can tag along with people like RL who can tell a hermit thrush from a wild turkey. <laughs> <laughs> Dwayne's thrush or Leary, yeah, right. that's, that's a fair competition, uh, comparison. Get the experts and hang around, hang close to the experts and, and uh, learn what they know. That, so it's a great, great opportunity. That's definitely how I started learning this Christmas bird counts with experts in Wisconsin. So these Christmas bird counts, you can see the dots here basically everywhere and, and, and increasingly around the world. <coughs> I think you just went in after a mouse. I don't yeah. Know. yeah. <laughs> so you can, again, uh, the Christmas bird count side is, is clunkier to use than the breeding bird survey site, but there's, there's good data there. So you can go to that site and go here to the historical, and then you can go in and say, okay, talk about the species, what year range, what region. So you can pick just Idaho or the U.S., and you can pick the last 10 years, the last 15, or the last 12, or whatever you like. And remember that um, breeding, and it's slow to load. <laughs> the breeding bird, uh, the Christmas bird count started in, what, 1900? So we've got uh, 100 and, what, coming up on 18, 19 years. This is uh, the year 119. Yeah. So talk about our data run. I mean, this is really spectacular, even though it was kind of weak in the early days, not, not yeah, the, the thing about using the, the Christmas bird count site, you need to know not to count year, I mean the, the calendar year, but the count year. The calendar year. Yeah. So this, if you want to look up this past year, you would look up one, not 1917, you would look up 118. Year 118. Mm. Right. Mm. So just for fun, mm. we'll look at Siskins from the Christmas bird count uh, perspective. And again, remember, Chris, the Breeding Bird Survey started in 1966, so this data run is starting in 1900. You get a lot of this sort of thing in the early decades because the sample sizes are small, not too many people doing it, so you get wild variation. 
But as populations have increased and people have become more uh, constant in doing Christmas bird counts, you start getting probably over the last 40, 50 years, probably pretty good data. But again, you can see, uh, sort of deliberately picked a bird that's really noisy. So here's I.O. Christmas bird counts, similar to the breeding bird survey, a lot of noise, but what do you notice here? It doesn't look like there's any decline in Christmas, Christmas count. Yeah, it's bouncing around a little bit. This is pretty flat. Maybe it was a little bit higher in here, but that's just a couple of really peak years, a couple dives. So it's really, you, you don't see a strong decline. So we know that this is a particularly messy bird because siskins are nomadic, and they move around based on where cone crops are, and they move in big groups. So you get a lot of noise in the data, but it looks like at least the birds that are coming here in the winter are not declining. The birds that are breeding are declining. So the question is, if the birds that breed here not winter here, do they go somewhere else? Is there a good chance they do? We don't know. So just, you know, one sort of puzzle after another when you start looking at these data at this scale. House finch, remember a strong increase in, during the breeding season, look at the winter. Well, they had a pretty good long run, and now it looks like they might actually be going down a little bit in the winter. So once again, a mismatch between what the breeding season says and the winter says. We assume, these guys are residents, we assume these are the same birds that are being counted in the breeding season and in the winter. So it's a little odd to try to figure out how to explain that. Why is not there a strong increase coming out of the winter data? I haven't heard anybody talk about that. I have no idea. So if you want to go back to school and get a master's degree in biology, <laughs> there are lots and lots of opportunities <coughs> for research. Okay, but Raven, same picture, right? The exact same picture as we get with the breeding season data. Strong, strong linear increase. And even these last four years it show up exactly the same. Very strong increases over the last four years or three years. I think what a lot of that too for for like in the case of Boise is uh, because we have access to the landfill and there can be hordes of them up there. Yeah, so landfill, yeah, a good food source, same thing, right? We'll get renewable bolts, see a similar increase over time. <coughs> Powder doves, that's a little surprising. It's the only thing, the only graphic color dove I've ever seen that has a down in it. You know, everywhere else it's just up, 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 up. Well, you know, you don't know, it could be, maybe a count wasn't, uh, maybe it was a bad day somewhere and they didn't see any doves, so the number's off, who knows. So again, just to compare these, as I already said, with the Siskins, uh, very different story between breeding season decline, winter seems flat, a raven, same story on both, both times of year. So we're pretty familiar with eBird data, I think, but I'll just again walk through this. Um, Fairly quickly, you go to eBird and go up to Explore to change their, their home page. And this is some kind of warbler. In the old world, I assume it doesn't look like a warbler to me. And the species maps you probably looked at right down here. So again, looking at, uh, when I look at pine siskin year round, gives you a really, shows you how incredibly broadly distributed these are. So this is all, uh, all the sightings of all Siskins year round. So I mean, they're way down into the Mexican mountains, they're up here in the Aleutians, you know, they're everywhere. Evening Girl Speak, once again you see this <coughs> occurrence right here, but again remember there's, no, there's not many roads and not many people starting right here. So this is sort of un, undersampled, in fact it's unsampled. If you don't have at least a gray box, that means there's no there's no data there. Nobody's ever even tried to count a bird there, that were at least not a few negroes. Well, I like one thing, one of the other ones that has a steep decline. You see the really wide, uh, less wide distribution than no, but sporadically showing up as far as Newfoundland uh, and up in that part of the world. Crazy. We had a Harris's Sparrow, was that just last winter? The Harris's Sparrow down here, we keep hoping he's going to come back. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of fun to, to see these uh, more these more rare birds in this part of the world 
We see if you want, I really want to see Harris the sparrow in the winter. We know they're in the southern great plains with the American tree sparrows and the long spurs and the other prairie birds that just kind of go straight south, but they really do get scattered around quite a bit in the west, you can see here. One of the new things that uh, Cornell has started to do with eBird data, and I, I really love this graphic, this basically shows, takes all the sightings, in this case of black and the long spur, they've been working on the prairie birds first, all the sightings of black and the long spur, and then shading it by where, where they are most of the year. So this is zero, and this yellow is uh, like 20%. So you can see they're spending, most of the Latin and long spurs are spending most of their time in this, this area here. And then as you get into these darker spots, a little bit here, you're getting uh, fewer birds for less time. So it's kind of a weighted, a weighted uh, distribution map similar to what the breeding bird survey did. And once again, as they, as they do these, I hope these will start to replace the, the uh, range maps and field guides, because it give it a lot better dimensionality to, to the abundance. Okay, Project Feeder Watch. I already mentioned Project Feeder Watch, the good program to participate in this time of the year. Uh, a year ago, and I'm just gonna show you some of those data again. A year ago, they did a 30-year analysis of Feeder watch data. And I think that we're 30 years of feeder watch. So that I think the report is still up on their website. But just to look at a couple of things that they were able to do. So here you have uh, Northern Cardinal 1989 to 1990 is where they were. And then where were they in 2015 to 2016? And even just with the naked eye, you can see there's like almost no difference in those distributions, right? Very common all over the east and the southeast down into Arizona a little bit, and then way up in the northeast. But if you look, this to this is about the same. And you can do, you can do a statistical analysis of those overlays. Uh, a little different story, go back to our evening gross peak we've been worried about. You can see the distributions 89 to 99 in darker colors, more gross peaks. And look at the cutoff where the people stop living so sharp. But <coughs> very strongly different pattern for evening gross peaks. So now this is a related, kind of maybe somewhat related to the Christmas bird count data, but it's but it's a different set of data, right? It's people watching feeders. So it's really the third way to look at evening gross bird population trends. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, pretty much the same picture, right? They're just they're either moving north and out of where people live, or their populations are just going down and maybe both. Cooper's hawks as we know, have been uh, increasing pretty steadily across the United States in urban areas. I just missed getting a great picture one sitting on a stop sign uh, next to my house two nights ago. Of course, by the time I got my camera out, it, it was gone. But uh, I had never seen one on a stop sign before. But they're certainly around. I see one, see one almost every day when I walk by dog. So, so here's the Peter Watch thing. You can see a really strong increase in it. A little dip like that. Similar to what was shown in the collar dough, it probably doesn't mean anything, it's probably just a little anomaly. No, reason. Of course, they're making hay off of uh, all these other feeder birds. And the feeder, again, this is feeder watch data now for collar dough. Well, everything we know about collar dough shows they're increasing strongly, but so is this. And it's hummingbird, really spreading north. Which is great, and we hope they keep coming over this way. I would love to have some manas around here with you, wouldn't that be nice? You gotta love these northern finches, much like siskins and uh, gross beaks and other birds, uh, <coughs> birds that tend to really be erratic. Look at, talk about erratic, look at that. Just nuts. Probably that's going to be flat, maybe slightly increasing, but probably a flat trend, and just up and down like crazy from the end of the year. Enormous variation. And of course, all these nomadic species coming out in big flocks and, and searching for food, and they'll, they may be here one year, and the next year they're not, and the next year they are, and so forth. So you can see really crazy numbers of those northern birds. One other thing that uh, is kind of interesting in Peter Watch is they've also got a mapping facility. If you haven't looked at that, go, go look around. If you don't go 
open dates and regions, the usual sort of search stuff. Again, look at Harris's Pharaoh, again, based on feeder watch data. Well, we know they're in the Southern Great Plains, but it looks like if you want to see Harris's Sparrow in the winter, right there, wherever that is, someplace in Kansas. That's, that, I think that's, yeah, yeah there's Oklahoma border, Oklahoma, Kansas, so right there is where all Harris's Sparrow are. So if you want to go down and see them during the breeding season. American Tree Sparrow, again, another big northern species that comes into the south, but look how widely distributed they are in the winter. Um, seems to be quite a pile right there for some reason. Bunch right there, but we can get them way over in here. So another lens on where these birds are. All right, so that's the end of that. I just want to point out that uh, population size is another uh, factor we, we use in uh, trying to figure out the vulnerability of different species of birds. I will talk about that a little bit in February. We use a lot of the same data, but do it in a different way to figure out, you know, are, how many evening gross species are there? Are there a thousand, a million, a billion? And that's a, it's a tough question to answer, but it's an interesting puzzle. Okay, so I want to make a quick spin through our feeder birds again. I always like to, uh, but instead of just showing them like I have in the past, I thought I'd do a little, little different look. So, how big are they? And this is not one of our top 25 birds on feeders, but it's a great picture, so. <laughs> so there, so I'm gonna look at weight. Weight of these birds. Weight of our top 25 feeder birds. There's the weight, the weights, all the way from less than an ounce to what, almost 18 ounces. That's all 25. Anybody know what that is? The smallest? The smallest bird coming to our feeders that's in the top 25. So these are not rare, these are pretty common birds. The smallest one. Gold, you know the smallest bird goldfinch. Goldfinch. Which goldfinch? Lesser. Lesser. Lesser goldfinch. Oh, good. Now this was new for me because I, I hadn't really thought about how much these birds weigh. So I thought this was kind of cool. I'm going, wow, really? All right. So the next three all weigh the same. Red breasted nut hatch. Black cap chickadee and mountain chickadee. So just slightly bigger than our little goldfinch, but all the same on average. I never thought of a pine siskin as being heavier than a, uh, a chickadee. But, and it's not much. <laughs> These are, you know, parts of ounces here. But they're on average a little heavier. And I was like, really? American goldfinch. Now these are the same genus. I always thought of them as being the same, really, you know, except the plumage and so on and so on. But American goldfinch is slightly heavier. Next, house finch is a female house finch, and that makes sense. I think a house finch has been bigger than all these guys for sure. Another tie. The next three: downy woodpecker, white-breasted nuthatch, which we get in the east and the north. We don't get too many around here, of course. And junco. Now I never, Gosh, under the sun, thought of a junco and a downy woodpecker as weighing the same. So it shows you how your, you know, it's the length of the woodpecker. I think yeah. it's a longer bill and longer tail that sort of hides its weight. <clears throat> so this is I'm still scratching my head over this one. I know triple check the numbers. <clears throat> I'm all about birds. You know, that kind of begs a question to me because it's something I've been wondering about. You.
right at 10 o'clock. That's never happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I couldn't move. <laughs> Okay, well thanks for coming. If you does anybody need binoculars that wants to go birding?